Hello and welcome to the Rust Belt Apartment Podcast presented by the Cooper Multi Family Team where we focus on all things apartments with a keen eye on the Midwest's Rust Belt region. I'm your moderator Peter Grayless and as always I'm joined by my co-host and teammate Anthony DeMarco. I'm pleased to welcome today's guest Richard Lamondon. Richard is the co-founder and co-CEO of Ecosystems, a rapidly growing water and energy conservation firm based in Miami. They're focused on proving that conservation is good for business through sustainability for the real estate industry. In 2019, Richard was selected as Endeavor Miami's Entrepreneur of the Year and was named one of South Florida Business's Business Journal's 40 Under 40. In 2020, Ecosystems was recognized by Inc. as the 48th fastest growing private company and fastest growing environmental services company in the United States. Richard, it's a pleasure having you. Thanks for joining us on the podcast. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, excellent intro. It's our pleasure. Um, happy to have you on the pod. Our team has been working with ecosystems here um, for, for quite a few years. Uh, we certainly see the value in what you guys do. Um, and a lot, of our, our, a lot of our listeners do, but I have to imagine a lot of folks don't. They don't understand or even you know, realize what, what water and energy conservation is. So I thought we could perhaps kick off by a little, you know, water and energy conservation 101, um, explaining to our listeners kind of what you guys do. Uh, and then from there, we can, you know, take a look at the benefits it provides environmentally for businesses, jump into a couple of case studies and just kind of see where this conversation goes. But why don't we set the table by, uh, you know, just a brief explanation of, of what you guys do uh, down at Ecosystems. Perfect. Well. Uh, as you said in your intro, like we were founded under the premise that businesses can be part of the climate fight and that, uh, you know, our whole MO and our genius is to align uh, capitalistic incentives with uh, public benefit for all. And so uh, if you zoom out to the bigger issue, right, I mean, and that's been covered around climate change and, uh, you know, energy challenges. You know, I mean, everyone's seeing stuff at the gas pump right now, right? Sure. Um, uh, water has gotten a little bit less uh, uh, coverage. However, if you've looked at anything out west or even um, what's happening now, it all ties in. Uh, in, the, in the Rust Belt and a lot of other cities, uh, there's the major issue that we find is along with climate change and all the changes that are happening to uh, how we receive energy and water, uh, our infrastructure is aging. Mm. Right. I mean, we all have older cities, a lot of this infrastructure. Let's let if we touch on water, for example, a lot of this was built after World War II. Yep. And those are some old pipes now. I mean, I'm sure some of your listeners have dealt with like those old cast iron pipes that uh, start to go bad and sag. And imagine that on the entire infrastructure line that delivers your water. Right. And so um, we both have an issue with uh supply challenges due to climate, but also due to how we deliver. And so um, when starting the company and, uh, and focusing on the real estate industry and multifamily in particular, what we did is we try to focus on root cause, right? And so we went to uh, EPA's website where they said, US homes waste just in leaks a trillion gallons of water each year. Wow. Um, Toilets, 20% of all toilets in the United States are currently leaking up to 200 gallons of water a day. So, I mean, I don't have the stats on how many toilets, but let's say there's one per person. <laughs> We're looking at like 325 million, 20% of that. That's a lot of leaking uh, lot of going leaking. on. Um, and this is a particularly acute problem if you start looking at vintage. So you start drilling down, you know, into vintage, vintage real estate, stuff so sure. pre-2000. Sure. Uh, that's a lot so, of what we have up here, right? Is, is that post-World War II boom or that 50s, 60s, 70s vintage? Absolutely. And to go, you know, and so as we kept drilling down, then it was like, okay, in addition to that, uh, efficiency is a challenge, right? You know, everyone's seen those big three and a half gallon toilets or, you know, uh, properties still using halogen light bulbs or contact fluorescent light bulbs. And so um, really what, what our focus has been is, uh, getting to these root causes that are both causing uh, uh, wasting in water and energy and identifying them and helping explain the business case that not only is this a good environmental play, 
but there's a clear return on investment attached to everything that we do. And, you know, sometimes what happens is people want to get to like, hey, how do I put smart this and technology that? And I say, slow down. Before you start utilizing the 21st century technology, you got to get you there. Right. <laughs> and so, and so that's why I, I sing the gospel of like, you know, we can call it like the toilet light bulb gospel or whatever we want to call it here. But um, ultimately, uh, by focusing this granularly, uh, you know, we saved over 6 billion gallons of fresh water. We prevented 150,000 metric tons of CO2 from being in the atmosphere. And uh, I believe that's like 80 million six, utility costs. 6 billion gallons you guys have saved? Yes. Although I will say I was looking up statistics before this call. All that uh, the Cleveland the Ohio uses five trillion. The bucket is the uh, uh, oh, uh, Rich, we're gonna have to have you repeat this here. We're losing yeah. apt, but yes, yeah, six billion gallons. Our little company. <laughs> oh no, uh, yeah, the internet connection just came across as unstable. Um, can you hear me now? It's okay. We lost we lost you a little bit. You you had gone into. I was kind of flabbergasted by. You guys had saved six billion gallons. Uh, you then went in to describe Cleveland and in what we lost. We lost you there. I'll roll back. So basically, Ohio uses five trillion gallons a year. Just the state of Ohio. <laughs> um, so you start thinking about the scale of and inefficiency that's going on in a state like Ohio, and you start expanding that nationally. Uh, I think you start to see why uh, we need more than just a company like ours and, and why us growing and companies like us growing is so important, uh, both for impact and for helping uh, apartment owners. Richard, how'd you get into the industry? It's, um, it's obviously a niche. Uh, you know, I don't think there's many young men that say, when I grow up, I want to conserve water. Although perhaps, perhaps maybe there was an environmental lean from you a little backstory on it um so i joke sometimes that i'm like yeah when i grew up i wanted to be a glorified plumber or electrician right? but <laughs> yeah. um the uh the story is my dad was a real estate developer down here in new york and then in, in miami in the early okay. days and so we grew up around real estate uh but my brother and i also uh avid water sports particularly my brother loved to be outdoors and so what we really wanted to do was marry our experience in real estate with how we can impact the environment. And so where that led us, it could have led us, and we, we always say to a lot of different places, but when we kept seeing these kind of statistics and thinking about it and being like, why isn't anyone doing anything about this? Mm. Um, it, it basically, I think part of the reason why is because in a lot of ways, it's not like we, we are creating the next Google or anything like particularly sexy on that arena. We got really granular and got our hands dirty and, and in an area that I think a lot of folks may not be interested in. Sure. Um, but I think that by focusing on that, um, by marrying the white collar, consulting with the blue collar work that we do, um, I like to call it green collar. But I don't know if that actually fits. Um, I love that. Uh, you know, by doing that, we we really have, uh, I think, hit on uh, a big need. And actually, uh, in terms of like less part of my area, but in terms of job growth and with uh, the recent legislation passed by the federal government, there's a huge shortage of these types of jobs and huge opportunity for 21st century trades that I think uh, policymakers don't really look at. So that's a whole nother type of conversation. You can dive into right there. Whole nother podcast. Yeah. You guys are based, you're based in Miami. Yes. Uh, I'm not sure if I told our listeners that based in Miami, Florida, uh, you guys cover the entire state or the, the entire country, rather, all 50 states, correct. correct? We've I think we've worked in about 35, 36 uh, as far away as Hawaii and is uh, in the west side and as far northeast as uh, I believe Pennsylvania. So kind of covered most of most of the U.S. geography. Um, and we're we're not. Uh, you know, a huge national company. We're, I think our head counts about 85 people, but we're able to seed teams in different areas of the country and have them travel around. And uh, we're lucky to work with great partners that 
um, give us the opportunity to prove our model to them. And once they're with us, they seem to stick with us just like you all um, over the years. Sure. Richard, you, you mentioned uh, you, you have you have 85 people and that, that travel around. I, obviously, from our experience working with you guys, we, we know that, you know, you guys have uh, multiple travel teams, but maybe explain to everybody how you guys go about doing business in Hawaii or in Pennsylvania when you guys are situated and heavily located in Miami. That's a great question. I think it's worth zooming, like stepping back to how our whole process works. Um, Sure. So how, how it works in general, an ownership group, a management company, a forward thinking brokerage will come to us and like will, that. you know, basically <laughs> not, there aren't too many like you. I'm being serious. Uh, you know, we don't get approached too much from the brokerage side of things um, where they'll approach us and, you know, they'll say, hey, you know, we're, sometimes it's, hey, we have these really high utility bills. How do we deal with that? More recently, particularly at the larger scale organization, it's, hey, we need to develop a sustainability strategy. How do we do that? But how do we do that in a way that it's not some consultant gives us a big, thick book and then we don't do anything about it. Yeah. And so what we'll do is we will assess the portfolio. We'll identify areas of either high rates or there's potential rebates and incentives or there's potential regions of the country where we know they're more like it's more friendly to implement this type of work. And so we'll identify a, a target hit list and we'll kind of tier and we'll dive deep into utility bills. Uh, if we're doing a full service water and energy conservation work, we actually get out to the site, we inventory all the different equipment on the site. We deliver a report saying, okay, here's, here's everything you have, here's everything you can do, but let's prioritize by whatever your goals are. Is it what's gonna save you the most money? Is it what's gonna impact the environment? Is it a blend? Um, and so once we understand the goals of the partner we're working with, um, we'll design programs for them and we'll help them develop uh, goals. Let's say you're saying, hey, we wanna save a billion gallons of water across our portfolio, or hey, we wanna save 50,000 metric tons of CO2. It's like, okay, well, based on your portfolio, here's what we would need to do to get there. And so um, the benefit of working with someone like us is that we also implement. And so we're not giving you these fanciful numbers that are made up, like we're giving you hard bid construction numbers to implement these projects. And so um, it's tough being, you know, vertically part of the entire process, but we, we wouldn't have it any other way because uh, there's right now, the way most people deal with this is disjointed multiple vendors, yeah. depending on what part of the country you are. And so most of the partners we work with have stuff in multiple states, whether if it's across the Rust Belt, whether if it's the Sun Belt, you know, whatever belt you want to, you want to name, they have, probably have assets there. And so, um, so we'll, that why now going into implementation, when you say, okay, let's move forward this project, which has, you know, return on investment numbers and savings numbers attached to it. Uh, then what happens is one of our teams in the region would go ahead and implement for you. So in the Rust Belt, for example, we have multiple teams right now circling, you know, the Illinois, Ohio, Pennsylvania, you know, Missouri, you know, and they can expand out from there and they're built to be on the road 365 days a year. So if there's something even like a little outside in Iowa and Kansas, like they can get there. Um, you know, that's our problem to worry about, not yours, basically. Um, so, and so what happens is, is with these larger portfolios, we're able to service stuff in the mid Atlantic in the Midwest and the Rust Belt out in Arizona simultaneously, because we built those regionalized teams over these years. Um, at the very end of the experience, we uh, create an impact report where we demonstrate, you know, where did you hit based on your goals? What's your, what are your impact numbers? I think Anthony, you've probably seen some of those, um, you know, so we, and how do we do versus what we expected, right? If we told you that your ROI was two years, where'd we go? Was it a year? Was it three? Can we figure out why? And so, um, all of that kind of plays in to really give an owner a lot more intelligence on their asset and a much stronger uh, asset at the end of the experience. Well, yeah, and you guys are there start to finish, like you mentioned. You're not just handing over a thousand-page book with quote-unquote recommendations. You're starting I, I there. That. 
Yeah, you're starting there. You're sending the now, Richard. When you say you have teams all over the country, these are teams of installers. Correct. Yeah. Okay. So also, our I mean, I would say probably sixty five percent of the company is is operations field installers or their support team. Uh, I mean, our company is distributed in general. We're headquartered in Miami, but probably only about fifteen out of eighty five of us are here. So oh, okay. Um, you know, in this day and age of remote work, like we were doing it without knowing what we were doing beforehand, simply because oh. it's a big country to cover. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, we have folks all over the country and we'll continue to grow like that because, you know, something like this, being an environmental challenge like this, it can't be done at a local level. It has to be done at scale to be effective. Sure. So, you know, Something that uh, you know Richard talked about early on in, in getting started and why they got into it, um, and I know that you know he mentioned you know, he doesn't always hear you know from the brokers, but you know, one thing that we realized early on, and I realized early on in my career, um, starting here in Ohio, I mean Richard talked about the amount of water right that 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 is being used here in Ohio, and and it's a huge problem, right? And so when I started out. We were really looking for pain points. Um, you have a long, you have a lot of longtime owners here in, in in the Cleveland area, Northeast Ohio, in the Rust Belt, right? In, in specifically, you have a long, a lot of longtime you know, private owners, right? It's not a, a institutional style market, and it really hasn't been for a really long time. Um, so you'd have to imagine with a lot of longtime ownership and the vintage of the assets, the one of the biggest pain points that I would come across is water. Um, mm. And you just started realizing that. And, and, and to be honest, that's what ended up uh, getting us in touch with, or, or that's when the relationship really cultivated was, hey, where do we look and how can we help our clients? Um, you know, we don't have the volatility here in Northeast Ohio where there's sales and trades, you know, multiple times a year. Um, so we truly do have to really look in and dig into the weeds with our clients to, to really show you know, the value that, that we can, that we can bring to the table as well. And so uh, teaming up with ecosystems and seeing, you know, a lot of what they do, uh, all of the analysis reports. I mean, I, I couldn't tell you one that Richard and his team provided for us that there wasn't a significant amount of savings. Um, not on, yeah. there wasn't one. Now, what I will say is uh, with all of that said, Right. Um, we have not. We we didn't move forward with, with all of those analysis or those projects or those plans. So, you know, Richard, how how does your team um, go about you know uh, overcoming some of that and really proving to people that you know it sounds great on paper, but you know the the, the reality is, is this is a true NOI enhancer that you know you, you can't you can't shy away from or forget about. And, and so maybe talk about that a little bit. Absolutely. And, you know, another piece too, is so when we started working with you, so you were, I, I realized the power of upfront numbers. And since then, actually, we've been much more heavy also with a bunch of our partners on being part of their due diligence process. So making sure that in the underwriting, and so that's what you were doing with us a lot of time is, hey, either we're selling an asset or whatever, like let's underwrite some potential value add you know, services that we can, we can provide as part of maybe a new owner coming in or whatever it is. That's what I mean by forward thinking, like very few folks approach us about that. And so that got our wheels turning like, Hey, maybe at scale, we should, we could be part of the due diligence process on the buyer side too, to potentially add the same kind of value. Um, but what you touched on another piece is the greatest challenge that I have faced in founding and growing this company has definitely been education. Right. And proof of concept. And let me tell you, when that's the first five years of our experience, we're going to hit 10 years old in October or what they call bootstrap. So like I have that whole, like living in a back house, no investors until I didn't need them anymore type of thing. Um, uh, you know, we had a pound the pavement and no one believed what we were saying. And so what's happened now is I have hundreds of case studies and results that I can provide and, um, to show it. And what happens is there's varying degrees of, of skepticism, but I would say that the amount of educating I need to do has improved tremendously um, mm. over the years. Like it seems like people have 
over time, like the problem has become more prominent. Um, one really good example, I think within about the unit range where you all work is, so we did a project in, uh, where is it here? Sorry, let me pull it up. It's in Columbus, Ohio. Okay. It was, uh, it was 160, sorry, 238 unit property okay. in which we came in uh, and save them $126,000 a year in water costs on an $140,000 project. So, uh, and this is just a water and energy. What we did there is we upgraded their toilets to new water efficient toilets, new shower heads, new faucets. Uh, on this one in particular, we also actually uh, installed new um, washer dryers in some mm -hmm. of the units. Um, they had some aging ones and they wanted to, uh, you know, they want to do a test pilot in one building around this is an amenity. So actually we, we, we added some water to that project because they wanted to use it as amenity, but we used obviously water efficient products and they saved, yeah, $126,000 a year wow. on water. And so, you know, not every property is going to hit those kind of numbers. They, they made their money back in about 14 months, uh, wow. which you say, you how many say, investments you can make that, that have that kind of return. When you say a full water project, is it just toilets or, or what does that include? Um, so the, the main, as I said before, so the main water users in any type of property, number one is, is going to be a toilet. It's where the leaks happen. It's where the most usage happens. Um, hundred percent. Other second biggest area showers. And so what we do is, uh, we don't try to change behavior. We try to flow with behavior. And so rather than, you know, say, okay, do an education program, shower less, like we'll give you a, a good pressure, more efficient shower head, right? That's kind of our goal. Um, and the ownership group can help choose which one they want. There's varying price points and needs. Um, the third biggest are the faucets. And so uh, in this particular project, we, uh, we didn't put in new faucets. But although we can do some kind of light renovation work for someone, we change the aerators, which are basically like the filters that control the flow rate. Um, so that kind of work is, is really where we got to. And then, like I said, we actually added some usage by doing one building of washer dryers for them. So, um, you know, that's, that's really the main bread and butter program that, that owners can bank in to know that there's likely savings involved. We can go deeper. Like we can put, uh, some work with the tub spouts if they want to, and there's other different areas, but this particular ownership group was looking for the best return they could get. And so we focused purely on, okay, in terms of return on investment, where do you want to be? Um, on this property, by the way, we also did a full common area and exterior lighting program uh, where they wanted to update to LED. Um, so uh, we both moved everything from, uh, old fashioned halogen bulbs, I mean, lighting to LED. And we added in um, some additional lighting for them to light up some parking lots and street lighting where uh, maybe they thought there were dark areas that, uh, or, you know, and some monument lighting that if they didn't want the, they want the property to pop a bit more, or have a little more curb appeal. Um, you know, we made sure that that work was done in a way that was efficient. Um, so there's, there's all different, uh, that work was more done for aesthetics, but in an efficient manner. So like I said, when we have these conversations with owners, it's all about what their needs are and us discovering what they wanna do. Are they trying to reposition an asset? Are they just trying to drive you know, better NOI? Every, every group's different. Um, and so we, we're not a one size fits all because of that. Now I have to ask you because I get this question all the time. Uh, especially from the stubborn guys, the guys that, you know, the quote unquote, I know it all guys, right? Um, well, if I put a 0.8 flow or 0.8 flow toilet in, I'm just going to deal with uh, all backups. And, you backups, know, yes. Nothing's going to flush through. There's not enough pressure. How do you, how do you respond to that? So in my experience, I think we've done, I have to, I have to pull up the exact number. I could send it to you, but at least 500 different communities. Of those, I, two of them, we've seen that. So it's not, it's not impossible, but you know, like we're talking 
you know, mega money odds almost that like in terms of uh, when this type of challenge happens. I mean, in an older asset, there are, there are things that could potentially go wrong. The, my question to them is, first of all, is how have you been maintaining the sewer system? Have you, have you, uh, you know, ever um, flushed out the sewage system? How long have you owned the property for? Um, so that's, that to me, is, if you're concerned about that, that's a first step. In every instance where we've seen a challenge, it's because the property wasn't actually being well maintained. And so, um, but I would say, like I said, two out of 500 plus, um, it really hasn't been a challenge. And we only work really on vintage. So um, it's not like we're doing mostly like newer construction that, uh, yeah. you know, I excuse the numbers. Like this is something that I always say, look, this is possible. However, you know, the numbers speak for themselves and quite frankly, if this encourages you to take better care of a property that you're going to own for quite some time or, you know, look to drive more value in, it's only good maintenance. That makes sense. Do you see a um, states that experience drought, like California, Arizona, West Coast? Um, are you seeing a bump in that business, a part, you know, different from what we would find in the Midwest or the East Coast? You know, what's interesting is about out West is they started this sooner. So we still Makes do sense. a lot of work. We do some work in California out West. Most work we do is in Arizona, Colorado. Okay. Um, and that's just where the assets are. But sure. what I would say actually is where we've seen the most growth is in the areas you would expect less in the Rust yeah. Belt, in the Sun Belt, in Florida, you know, or Georgia, where you think, wow, there's a lot of water, for example, in a state like Florida. Yeah. Um, or even Ohio, right? Or yeah, Ohio, Lake Erie exactly. Right here. Yeah. Exactly. Well, in Ohio, I, I don't know enough about the local issues to tell you anything beyond, I do know the infrastructure is aging. In Florida, there's salt water coming into the drinking water aquifers, right? So there's a need for conservation. Uh, the, each state has its own challenge in an sure, interesting sure. way, rainfall patterns, but absolutely out West, um, they're in a bad way. Um, and you see that a lot in, in the incentives and the water rates, but not always. Believe it or not, some of the highest water rates we see are actually in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, energy rates vary as well. While some of the lowest rates we see are in Las Vegas. Riddle me that. I don't get it. Any but, idea uh, why? Well, uh, Atlanta redid their whole sewer system. A lot of it was actually Civil War era uh, pipes, wow. some of them. Um, wow. So that's why I say infrastructure is the biggest driver of cost increases, but there's nowhere in the country that has experienced utility cost decreases, really. Maybe a few exceptions. Sure. All you see sure. is both on energy and in water, costs continue to increase. On the energy side, various reasons, cost of fuel, you know, getting new power plants online, shifting over to renewable energy. On the, on the, on the water side, delivery infrastructure. Who pays for redoing it? You do, right? It just comes through surcharges in your bill, increases in rates. Um, so this is the kind of thing that affects the entire country in its own way. Um, one of the areas we add value actually is understanding the different utilities. So for example, energy utilities typically are regional. So okay. Northern Ohio likely has its own utility. However, a Cleveland, Toledo, Columbus, all have their own water utilities. And so what's interesting is that water is municipal, energy is regional. And so we have to navigate different, you know, we're experts at navigating both the incentive structures in both those areas and in kind of explaining to you why maybe you're in a high rate paying area in energy, but you're in a low rate paying area in water and maybe it's not the best ROI play in this area, or maybe it is, right? So um, it's a really complicated landscape. Federalism is fun. <laughs> <laughs> so you're, I mean, you're not only working with owners, uh, occasionally brokers like ourselves, but municipalities are involved in this as well from like, are you dealing with municipalities is ecosystems Some. chatting with? Okay. Some. So we focus mostly on the private sector simply because it's the best way to deploy the most quickly. Um, but we did for a long time run a water conservation program in Denver in which we both benefited low-income folks, and it was a great program, uh, because utilities uh, 
of you know your owner's residence are a factor of their general housing affordability calculation, right? It's not one that gets touched on, but um, if they're seeing high utility costs, they're factoring that into whether they're going to accept the rent increase or not. Sure. For example. Mm -hmm. um, so it all kind of plays in together. And so um, in Denver, they had a program where we would go into low income homes and update them to conserve water. Um, and we also would work with some of the most wasteful uh, multifamily assets in the city that was a, they would identify for us hmm. and we would go and we would uh, target them to reduce consumption. But for the most part, we don't work too much with cities, mostly because uh, I'm too small to have a, a lobbyist on staff to figure all that out. <laughs> um, I'm just looking for who's going to say yes the most quickly and where we can scale. So if the opportunity presents itself, uh, we're happy to take it, but it's not, it's not a major focus. Sure. I will say, though, that where they can provide the most impact is giving carrots, right? So where are their rebates? Where are their incentives to do this kind of work? Where can maybe, great. Uh, where can we make this, this pencil for an owner uh, on the margins? Maybe, mm -hmm. Anthony, one of these, the know-it-all guys you're talking about who are like, oh, well, actually, oh, I get 50 bucks off every unit? Like, okay, this actually sounds a lot better now. Um, so that, those are areas that when we do the assessment process that we will say, hey, here's potential incentives. I think that's a big way that, um, that governments can help the private sector make the right call. Yes. I had success with that because, I mean, that sounds fantastic. Have you guys approached uh, – have you, have you guys gotten any of those incentives granted that maybe weren't there before because of your approach? So a mixed bag, right? COVID actually put a lot of pressure on a lot of utilities. There are a lot of folks who couldn't or didn't pay their bills in the pandemic. And so, uh, for example, that Denver program was mixed due to budget cuts due to COVID. Um, wow. So different areas. I would say it totally depends on the utility. We've done some work here. Actually, Miami, Miami struggles with a lot of things. But when it comes to this uh, this work, they've actually worked with us to say, hey, we actually have extra budget. So has Broward County, just north of Miami, uh, Fort Lauderdale is the main city there. Um, where we've, they, we've said, hey, we have this big project. You know, you have rebate caps. Can we potentially expand these because of, look at the impact that we think we're gonna see out of these projects. And they've said, okay, based on what we expect to use, we can increase the program. So there are some utilities that are willing to play ball. There are others that are not. So sure. like here's here's the here's it's just like everything right like yeah, yeah. who you're dealing with so yeah. um but i quite frankly i would love for folks to lobby for this uh i don't have the time nor the bandwidth to uh to bring any uh anyone to where they're not already at right now because well, i'm sure we've got a few lobbyists crazy. listening so <laughs> you guys heard richard get to washington that's hmm. right or your local municipality whatever. or your local sure start there start there yeah. Um, so we talked a bit about impact on business, uh, in the beginning of the pod, you had discussed again, some kind of some staggering numbers and the amount of, of water that was wasted through leaks. Um, you know, the environmental impact, um, that your work has, uh, is pretty cool. Um, you know, any, any other kind of fun, fun things to talk about there? I mean, you know, some of those numbers were staggering uh, just in the amount of water conserved. Absolutely. Um, you know, where, uh, is, where is this heading? What is, wh where is water conservation heading? Where's energy conservation heading? What trends are you seeing moving forward? Um, there's a few different ways to answer that. One is um, mostly all positive, quite frankly. I, like I mentioned before, I think less educating has been needed. And so at the decision-making level, I think this is for more and more people has become something that is strategic. Mm. Uh, and so I think within the industry itself, particularly now that we're entering a period of, you know, uh, where some folks may hold on to their assets for longer and look, look for other ways to add value. I think that this, again, no matter which environment you're in, is a good play because of it drives ultimately NOI. At the 
at the federal level, you know, I haven't read the legislation enough to give you the, the deep dive, but there's a lot in there for incentives for uh, multifamily owners to, you know, maybe think about solar as a potential solution, to think about, you know, installing heat pumps, uh, energy efficient heat pumps, to think about, uh, they focus more on energy, you know, that LED lighting work. And so, um, you know, I think that is encouraging, I think, for owners. Uh, going up even further, I think that, uh, believe it or not, even as our population has grown, if you want good news, usually when you talk to the environment, it's all bad news. Yes. Uh, uh, I need some good has, news. Yeah, consumption hasn't risen in line with population growth, right? So we are getting more efficient. I think the challenge is, you know, in terms of the scale of the issue, more needs to be done. But, you know, societally, like things are being done, right? And I think more and more businesses are realizing that, you know, it's beneficial to be part of this, mm -hmm. not to fight it. And so in a few different ways, with our folks who have maybe public funds and are large traded, uh, you know, they now have to report impact to investors and on the markets and things like that. And so, you know, there's pressures from that side to more, you know, to, to owners, like more family, long-term hold owners. Um, this is the type of thing where, you know, residents are looking to live in communities that they feel good about. I think that that's yes. been an adage in the industry for a long time. Yes. And so if you as an owner can do a program where, Hey, everyone, we, on our dime implemented this program that is saving the community, you know, half a million gallons a year, uh, you know, and is also reducing all of your utility bills, particularly if you do some kind of like ratio billing or something like that to the tenants, um, there's a lot of opportunity there. In addition to, hey, we actually upgraded all of the lighting, say common area, exterior, clubhouse, the community feels safer, it's using less energy. I think that there's a lot to be said for there's, there's areas of impact that benefit everyone. There's no mm. losers, mm. right? And I think that that is where uh, the focus should be in general. Like where are those win, win, wins across sure. every sector? And so that, that's what gets me excited about doing this kind of work is, is <laughs> that. Um, but th what I hate the most is the supply chain right now. But what I love the most is the win, sure. win, win, you know? How has, not, not to get too deep into that, how has the supply chain affected you guys? Has it been difficult? Absolutely. I think, you know, in every line of work, it's been difficult. I mean, yeah. our suppliers vary. Um, we go direct manufacturer, we use large distributors, depends on the, the product. But, but, but truly, you can't get the shower heads, you can't get the toilets, you can't get the aerators. It, de it depends on the product and the time. I mean, a certain... Yeah. We, we have a project coming up in Atlanta in which the owner wants a very specific uh, model in okay. which there's 200 left in the country and there's 300 units. And so I'm like, I'm sorry. Like this is literally from the horse's mouth. Like there's nothing left. Uh, huh. So, you know, we have to switch. Um, here's a fun story though. We, we imported a bunch of like sconce lighting, the stuff that goes on the side of buildings. Oh. And I, we get a call from the manufacturer and they say, hey, uh, a wave hit the ship and your container fell off. And I was like, is that is that the my dog ate my homework version of like supply chain? You know? Exactly. And, and so they sent me the ship uh, manifest and like a news story, like ship gets hit by a rogue wave, loses one third of containers. A like, rogue wave. You? Yeah, I was like, yeah, a one. rogue way. Yeah, let's try. <laughs> like you already delayed on that one. Um, <laughs> so and, and so I was my mind was blown that it was actually they weren't lying. It was the truth. And so then I have to go to the partner and be like, so I know what this sounds like, <laughs> but here's the article, here's the email. <laughs> to the best of my knowledge, we lost the product. We have to switch. Um, and so what we've been really good at is trial by fire, something becomes unavailable. We don't, we don't marry any specific lines because if they go short, we have to be able to find what's the next one up. We have, we're constantly also pushing our manufacturers to get better, stuff that's easier to install, stuff that you can maybe change the colors on 
with a maintenance person manually. So there's a lot of new technology mm -hmm. coming through that, for example, we're installing stuff where you can change your like exterior clubhouse lighting to different colors based on the season. So you can nice. have your Christmas lights. And yeah. so there's a lot of new technology flowing through, but we have to always be nimble. And I could say that's probably given me the most gray hairs over the past uh, 10 hey, years. <laughs> Richard, uh, how often should people be looking into their conservation? So let's say <laughs> something rip the bandaid off and do, does the full replacement or for example like the uh the the case study that you you talked about in columbus um is that like a set it and forget it thing or you know how often are you telling them that they should touch back with you guys that's a great point so one of the so you almost have to break it up into what you're doing but in lighting one of the great things about led lighting is that not only are there concert like energy use conservation savings there's maintenance savings because there's the burn time is longer. I would say, a, you know, on water side, I would say every, every six months, I would highly recommend doing some kind of preventive maintenance program, whether that's walking all the units, you know, checking for leaks, putting out notices, hey, something making a weird noise or whatever. What we find in general is that because these properties are so busy, it's hard to find good maintenance help. Uh, it's like getting your teeth cleaned at the dentist, right? I mean, if some other stuff's going on, like you might skip that, but mm. you don't get your teeth cleaned enough times and all of a sudden you got a whole mouth full of cavities. And so uh, I would say every six months, no matter what you do, uh, whatever preventive maintenance program you believe should be in place, whether that's with your HVAC systems, whether if it's with, uh, you know, walking the site to make sure all the lights are working properly, whether if it's, uh, putting on notices to report leaks of any kind. No matter what property we go into, there's always something we uncover We're like, oh, we didn't know that was there. And I can guarantee you that if there was a preventive maintenance program, that would be handled. They'd know. Um, yeah. And that's not sexy, you know? It's not like, it, there's not like, hey, install this thing and all of a sudden your problems go away. It's, you got to do the grunt work, I think, to really maintain. Uh, the value of an asset. And so that's, that's what I've seen more than anything else that, that folks can do. Fair enough. And, and yeah. as our compadre Gary would always say, the true terrorist to our assets here in Northeast Ohio is water. So, um, you know, that, that's a quick way to uh, have your body or your, or have your, uh, your asset go down a slippery slope. So 100%. Mm -hmm. I mean, you think about winter time, right? Pipes bursting, you know, you don't get, you don't have enough water flow through the pipes. Pipes are bursting. I mean, you put out your notices, right? But how do you really know? Mm -hmm. Sure. You know, you put sure. your notices. Okay, maybe you do a property wide walk. You know, an oncoming freeze is coming. You walk a certain subset of units. I mean, there's definitely a proactivity that I think owners should ask of their management companies when it comes to that, um, because you know, what it was Ben Frank would say was an ounce of prevention is better than a pound of cure, right? Yep. Um, so maybe it's a little cliche, but it's, I think in terms of managing an asset, it's of enormous value. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, but we talked case studies, we talked energy and water conservation 101. Um, Anything else you'd like to touch on before we wrap up, Richard? Again, thank you for your time, man. Good call. Real good call. I uh, didn't think this would be that, no offense, but I'm like, water conservation? What are we going to talk about for an hour? But this has been, this has been really good. But I interrupted. Right. Go ahead. No, no. I, I was going to say, like, we, we hit, you all are good questions. We hit a wide ranging subject, uh, line of topics. I mean, like I said, this is the type of thing where I had to, like, reel back the tangents because it touches so many things in terms of mm. affordability, in terms of how well you manage an asset, in terms, you know, where there's a lot of different areas this can go. But I think broadly speaking, we touched on a lot of areas I think of value. I, I, I can't think of anything I'd want to say that I didn't already say. I think for a lot of listeners out there that, that weren't aware of that this service exists, um, you know, hopefully this sheds some light and it's, you know, kind of a no brainer. Um, for most of our owners here, uh, you know, you touched on when, when, when our team lists a property, we're very proactive in, in chatting with the seller 
uh, on putting together a proposal to, to pitch to future owners as mm -hmm. part of a, a value add for that property. So um, all it's really good strategically stuff. Strategically speaking, it stands out enormously. I mean, you know, I bought a few smaller multifamily assets myself and no, and not one time was ever like, hey, here's a potential like shovel ready value add program that you can implement the second you close, you know? It's always like, you have to go find those yourself, right? So yes. making it making it part of the, the potential like uh, sale package to me is like, I, I'm not lying when I say you all are ahead of the curve there. I have not seen another group do that to the same extent with our type of service. They might do another, but just in my experience. So um, I think it's a huge credit to, to all of you there for really being forward thinking. Well, thank you. Um, and we thank you guys for your partnership because obviously you guys allow us to do that as well. And uh, and we just look to continue on with this and hopefully, you know, you guys continue to do more stuff in Ohio. And when it's a service, that's a no brainer. It's easy to sell. You know, exactly. I mean, we, we look like uh, the white knight and you guys look fantastic as well. Um, ecosystems.com is where our listeners can find more about Richard and his team. Um, Richard, thanks again for joining us. Um, look forward to the next podcast. Thanks thank so guys. much, Peter Anthony. Thanks, Great guys. Anthony, yeah. thank you so much, Richard. Thanks for joining us. Hey, thanks for having me. Really appreciate it. And yeah. I also want to thank Adcom, uh, who uh, we've set up our new podcast studio here. As you can see, there's some folks behind me. Uh, we're up in our game on the pod. Uh, so thank you to the fine folks at Adcom for allowing the Cooper Multifamily team to host the podcast from their studios. Richard, thanks again. Have a wonderful day.